Well, good morning, everybody, in this beautiful, beautiful September morning. Uh, thank the Lord for the day that uh, God has given to us. And if you're not here this week, I trust that you'll make it next week. And if you're out of town, across the country, thanks for joining us this morning. If you're in the parking lot, welcome. And for each of you who are faithful in being here this morning, I am uh, praising the Lord for that. Uh, God has given us this freedom. We talked about this in our prayer time earlier. The freedom to be here. And there are countries in the world that would give almost anything to uh, be under the teaching of the Word of God. So we ask God's blessing upon uh, His Word this morning. So if you have your Bibles, please open to Psalm 119. Lord willing, we're going to finish uh, verse 133 today and move on to verse 134. We've been talking about victory over sin. So let's read Psalm 119 starting in verse 129 through 136, this octave. Remember, David starts with a premise, and then he builds upon that. And we'll see this this morning as we get to verse 134. Uh, we should not be surprised that the context of verse 134 must come after verse 133. But let's read, and then we'll pray and ask God's blessing upon his word. Verse 119, I'm sorry, Psalm 119, verse 129. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me, as thou usest to do unto those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes, because they keep not thy law. Hope your fingers are nimble this morning. We'll be looking through some uh, scripture. But uh, last week actually marked the sixth month of our time in this octave. And our study over the last three or four weeks has focused on verse 133, where we're talking about victory that comes through Christ over sin. Uh, if you're early into this study, you've just joined us recently, it's good to be reminded that the key to victory is not just in verse 133, but it's in the entire octave. And, of course, it's in the entire Word of God. Uh, thus, to live the victorious Christian life takes what? It takes a daily feeding in the Word of God. We can't just, oh, I'll open my Bible this morning and pick a verse and read it and shut my Bible and check mark. I've done my Christian duty for today. Uh, that's not the relationship that we want with Jesus Christ. We've been using Charles Spurgeon's commentary, The Treasury of David, as our basis, as our outline. And, of course, our goal is that I want to get to know the Word of God more intimately because here is where I find the character of God. So I watch events unfold with David, with Saul, with Deborah, with Stephen, with Paul, um, with Ruth. And we see how God orchestrates and he applies his character to individuals and the, of course the result of that is I will get to know him more intimately uh, and as we discussed last week the result will be a greater and a deepening love for Christ and a diminishing love for sin it's got to go that way right so as we finish up here in verse 133 let's be reminded that the Christian who's feeding on the word daily and receiving that great nourishment, it's milk, I'm sorry, it's meat, it's not milk, it's not the baby food. Unless you're a brand new Christian, we should be feeding more and more on the meat of God word, God's word. And it's growing in Christ, it's putting the word of God into practice and experiencing victory over sin. And that is so, so, so encouraging. Let's go over to Song of Solomon, um, chapter 2. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Not a very big book. 
Song of Solomon, chapter 2. If you are maturing in Christ, if you have some years of maturity uh, behind you as a believer, sometimes it's easy to coast. Sometimes it's easy to take for granted. Sometimes it's easy to think that, hmm, I don't need to worry about that sin anymore. And uh, so let's be cognizant of two things this morning. The first one here is in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and verse 15. He says, Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. We've talked about this before, about Satan coming as the angel of light. And the spiritual lesson here is we need to be cognizant of those little things in life that Satan tries to sneak in and take our minds, our actions, our mouths, uh, our eyes to places that they should not go. Uh, these, these little foxes would not necessarily eat the grapes. And probably the grapes are too high for the fox to reach anyhow. But instead, the fox, of course, you're familiar with the foxes. They like to dig in the ground. Uh, they would dig around the grapevines, and they would also nibble off the little green shoots. So they may not have eaten the grapes, seemingly a big problem, but what happens when spring comes and the owner of the vineyard looks, of course the snow has melted, and now he sees that the vines have been nibbled around the bottom. Rabbits will do that in our neck of the woods. What kind of grape vines are going to grow that year? So a little, tiny, seemingly insignificant or even unseen situation, and yet that hot fall there is no harvest of grapes, or the grape harvest is very minimal. So that, that little whisper can have devastating consequences. That little thought that you allow to grow because you don't give it to God, and give it, uh, ask him to help you to overcome that can have some devastating consequences. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We've talked often of the mind. And of course that's where most of our actions start from. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 13. I think I have the wrong verse there. Hebrews chapter 12, that is not correct. But the verse says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, listen to this, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. I think it's safe to say that all of us have been the instigator at times of that little whisper, that little, it's true, but it's not worthy of being spoken. And where does that thought go? It lands in another person's heart through the mind. And what if it stays there? If somebody says something about you and I hear it, and I don't correct that individual, now I've slanted my thinking about you. It may not be huge, but it might be that little whisper that uh, is used. And here again, I have to be careful because through the mind, a thought, a word comes to my heart. What do I do with it? Do I allow Satan to just say, 
Yeah, you know, that's right. Last week, that what he said to you, and you put two and two together, and have you ever gotten angry with somebody, and they didn't do anything to you, but you thought they were going to do something or say something? I wakened up in the middle of the night angry with somebody because of a dream I had, and it's real. That's how our mind often works. So I'll wake up in the morning with an attitude towards somebody, which is pretty foolish, and I've got to step back and, urge, well, you know, whoa, this isn't true. It was in a dream, uh, you know, nothing to do with it whatsoever. But do we do that spiritual stop when Satan plays with a thought towards someone or towards a situation? Uh, let's be careful that we are not the cause of that root of bitterness. And then uh, second point, number one, be alert for those little things. But number two, we need to be teaching these to other people. You know, we're a little older in Christ, I trust, and we have a grave responsibility to share this. So let's go over to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, just over a few pages. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. We have to do this through our talk, but I think more importantly, through our walk. Uh, I am assured that our teenagers today and our younger children don't have enough godly men and women encircling them, praying for them, showing that the Word of God works, that yes, there is joy in serving Jesus. Uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about you know, being grave, but we don't walk out of the church this morning with long faces, yes, I'm so happy to be in the Lord. No, no. We need to show that the Word of God works in our marriage, in our workplace, in our retirement, in our ministries here in the church, uh, whether it's a work night or you're helping out with Sunday school or you're helping out with a VBS or you're serving a meal. Um, our kids need to see us as alive, spiritually alive, rejoicing, thankful to be walking with Christ. And 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11 uh, enforces this or reinforces this. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, we're talking about the world, uh, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? I don't have to tell you this morning the world is falling apart. You talk about the word dissolve, you know, and how quickly things have dissolved in our country. You know, from 10 years ago to today. From five years ago to today. From one year ago to today. We have watched this unfold, and now we have little children who are watching this. We were having lunch one day, and, and my grandson, four years old, uh, he prayed for lunch that day. And he said, and dear Lord, please take COVID-19 away. You know, my heart just ached for this little guy because... The world has preached that we have this terrible infection and everybody should be afraid. Well, for the believer, why should I be afraid? God is in control. Uh, I've often said that to individuals who have talked about devastation. I say, yes, but God's in control. And they'll say, yes, but. Got to get the humanity involved in that. Let's give it to God. Don't take it back. Um, so, how are we to live? What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? <clears throat> and that word conversation here is not just referring to my lips. It's referring to my lifestyle. So we need to be uh, the teachers. In verse 12, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The world is dissolving around us. And you know it's not going to get better. 
God tells us that. The farther man gets from God, the worse the conditions here are on earth. We look at Afghanistan, a godless nation, worshiping a god. No love, no joy, no peace. It's only a rigid God, and it's only for the select. So if you're a believer, there's no goal for these men except that you die. So we have Christians who are dying for their faith, but they are living out their walk with God. That's their conversation, their godliness. Um, so we have a responsibility as adults to be there. Um, if you were in my class in school when I taught, I might ask you a question that would refer to the lesson that we had. How will Jesus find me living when he returns for me? So if you had to pencil that answer on the test today, what would you say? How would Jesus find me living today if he were re to return today? You know, you bring up that situation that somebody says, you know, if you knew for a fact that Christ was going to return in one week, how would that change your life? You might be more inclined to make sure that that loved one hears the gospel message. But what would you write down? Perhaps the better question is this. Have you and I grown in our love for the word, our individual love relationships with Christ, and our obedience, our obedience to God's word? You know, in the last six months, do you see little glimmers of growth, or perhaps a huge jump in growth in your walk with God? You know, the question is, if not, why not? If I've taught you for six months on how to diagram sentences, and you say to me, what's the subject? You know, we're in trouble, right? I don't know what a verb is. Could you explain that to me again? I'm going to pull my hair out, right? And yet, Jesus doesn't pull his hair out when he sees a child of God who is not growing in Christ. Instead, his heart is grieved. And my heart would be grieved as a teacher if my student was still asking me the definitions of a subject and verb. <clears throat> But we have to answer these things to God. Joshua chapter 4, you don't need to turn there, but have I continued to build that pile of memorial stones? They've crossed the river, and God instructs Joshua to send each of the 12 tribes back into the river and pick up this large rock and make a memorial. I was studying that this week, <clears throat> first time I figured this out. But they actually took those 12 stones, and they didn't just make a pillar, but they cemented it together. Changed my whole thinking on this. So if you have ever done mason work, you know, when you put that pillar together and you use cement, it's supposed to stay longer than if you had just made a pile of rocks. Spiritually speaking, how long did that memorial pillar stay for the Jews? I'm sure quite some time. And God's instruction to Joshua was, hey, when your little ones say, Grandpa, what's that pile of rocks over there? Let me tell you what God did for us. And we need to have that mentality, whether it's a grandchild, whether it's a daughter or son, whether it's a friend. Is my study of the Word of God stronger? Am I looking into the Word of God in a more deeper way? Is my prayer time growing? The, the plea of David is to order my steps in your Word, God. And we know for a fact that often the obedience is more difficult than the understanding of responsibilities. But you know what? God is challenging me to greater responsibilities. 
He's challenging you to greater responsibilities. Uh, when I was a, I think I was 12 or 13, um, and I don't even recall all the ins and outs of it, but somebody gave me a book of poems. Now, what 12-year-old boy wants a book of poems? And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. And of all those poems in there, there's only one that I recall the context of. And it spoke of the river of uh, Jordan, Jordan River. And I don't know if you know where it flows, but it flows to the Dead Sea. So you have this living water. It's fresh. Where does it end up? In the dead body of water. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar. You can float in the Red Sea or the Dead Sea, uh, even if you can't swim. Um, you might not even want to be in there very long because it'll, you'll burn your skin. But if you keep pouring fresh word of God into a life and you do nothing with it, guess what happens? You become dead to listening to the Holy Spirit. You become dead in your interest to the Word of God. That is a serious, serious situation um, that we have to take responsibility for. God promises greater joy. He promises greater abundance. He promises a greater purpose in life. I was listening to a speaker this week at the KCA conference, and uh, he prefaced his message that morning with a story, true story, of this uh, young college student in China. And this man's wife had developed a, quite a, a growing relationship with this young lady, and he got involved, and they would take her for lunch when they would go to China on speaking engagements. But one day, uh, she asked some very spiritual questions. She didn't know she was asking spiritual questions. But why was I born during this time of my life? And what's the purpose of an individual being here on earth? And of course, the preacher side of this guy was like, oh, fresh meat, right? But just gently teaching this young lady. But he said, two weeks ago, he sat down with a young man who was in college, and he said to this young man, said, I've got my life all planned out, by the way. Not a good idea. <laughs> but he said, for the next five to seven years, I'm going to be in college, and then I want to travel. So I'm going to travel for the next five years, see the world, and then I'll be about 30, and then I'm going to settle down and get a very good job, and I'm going to work for 25 years, so now he's 55. I'm going to retire at 55, and I'm going to travel for the next 5 or 10 years. Um, he said, by the time I'm 75, I won't be able to travel anymore. And, of course, the question for all of us is, how are you going to pay for this, you know? Um, but he said, the sad fact is that this man was a believer. So here we have this young college gal from China searching for the answers to life, an open mind, and we have a young Christian college student who has pushed God out of the picture. God, you just, you can come along with me, but this is what my life's going to be like. The sadness of that and how many believers are in that situation today we have to be the testimony the Word of God works being a Christian there is no comparison to what it's like to walk with Christ and of course we must be reminded that I was a sin sick sinner filthy there was no hope for me and yet Jesus looked down and he saw me and he said, I love that man. I'm going to die on the cross for his sins so that he can come to me and we can have a wonderful relationship. You know, we, we walk outside and you see the wonders of creation out there. And that creator wants to have a, a relationship with man. How is that even possible? 
that God and his great power, his authority, would love this sin-sick sinner. But that's my creator, and he says, I love you, and I want to walk with you. Uh, a fellow only goes by the initials of J.F. took this verse, and let's go back to Psalm 119. He took this verse, and he just turned it into a real short three-point outline. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. In thy word. He says, this is the right path for human feet. Of course, mankind doesn't want to take the right path because he knows, at least he thinks he knows, what's the better path. And yet, the creator of the universe died for my sin, says, this is the path that I want for you today. Order my steps, the needed help to control the steps. So if I want to take the right path, I need help. I've got a lot of stuff missing upstairs in my brain right now. I need more spiritual help. And then thirdly, let not any sin. We have the perverting power of a dominant sin. And if you have a heartfelt relationship for God, you want to get victory over the sin and you want to walk in the steps that God has for you today. You know, these steps are so simple, simple enough for the child to understand, but what's the difficult part? Often it's the obedience. And we think our ways will work, don't we? You know? I've got my life all planned out. This is going to work out great for me. Hmm. God says, I have other ideas for you. Uh, we do enjoy some sins for a season, and this is where God works in our hearts. Uh, we think sometimes that we can have control to be good and to avoid the bad sins. We consider our efforts sufficient and deny God's help. Unless you say, well, I don't do that. That last time you had that little issue and you thought, oh, I can take care of this. And God said at the end of it, well, did you pray about this? Oh, no. Not how much easier could that project have been or that decision, but instead the thinking, Lord, I didn't give you the glory. You did not get the opportunity. I did not give you the opportunity to help me through this situation. So unfortunately, I didn't learn very much during this time period. You know, it's good for us to examine our lives and to honestly ask ourselves if our lives are demonstrating joy. You know, what's your joy level? I think that's the greatest indicator of a Christian's walk with God. Not that you've got a big smile on your face all the time, but there is joy in serving Jesus. How about peace, contentment, humility? How about the love to be in God's Word? Do you get up in the morning and, ah, what does God have for me in the Word of God today? That's a great question to ask the Father. You think He's going to answer it? Yep. Maybe for you it's noon. You know, what's for lunch today? You know, I'll say to my wife, what's for supper tonight? Oh, or, eh. <laughs> I tell her I could eat chili, a bowl of chili, once a week. I could eat a plate of spaghetti once a week. Um, but to be a Christian and say, what's for lunch today? God, what do you have for me? You're the miner. You're in that mine. You're searching for that, for that gem. And how about the, destruct the uh, distractions of life? David says in Psalm 46.10, Shh, be still. Just quiet. Be still and know that I am God. I do believe that Satan likes to play games with us and 
You know, he'll say, well, you know, you didn't pray enough today. Or you didn't praise enough today. What's wrong with you? Or you didn't spend enough time in the Word of God today. And when you've had a special time in the Word of God, he still likes to toy with us. Our prayer time is to be praise. Our prayer time is to be worship. And our prayer time is to be supplication, asking for help. And often, God just says, I think, to the, to the child of God, hey, let's just enjoy some fellowship and prayer. What does that mean for you? You know, if you're having a cup of coffee with a friend and you're just cheerfully chatting about the events of the week, maybe you have some prayer times, you're sharing some prayer needs, you know, that is so natural for you and your friend. And I don't want to take the reverence out of this, but sometimes we translate prayer time is it's very stiff, it's very rigid. You know, you've got to use the King James English. Um, but how much rejoicing do you have in prayer? How much chatter do you have in prayer with your Father? And how much praise time? You know, sometimes God just says, praise me. You know, that's kind of weird. You wouldn't do that for your friend, of course. You know, if your friend said to you, oh, we'll just talk about me today. <laughs> no. But you know, when God says, I just want some praise from you, what does that do for you? It just changes perspective. When your focus is on your Father. And sometimes there's some pretty serious things going on in prayer. And God wants the praise and he wants the worship, but he also wants you to understand, he wants me to understand I am all ears. I am listening to your prayer. I understand the heaviness of your heart. And I want to, to help you. Be still and know that I am God. We, we fill our lives with distractions. I've said this before. I think that we, as a church, have done this, and I'm speaking generally, we have done this because if there's noise going on, who doesn't get the attention? And if it's quiet, you know, for your child, if it's quiet, you know that he's involved in trouble, probably. But for the believer, if it's quiet, you know what? That gives God an opportunity to be knocking on the heart and saying, I want to talk to you, and not necessarily in a quote-unquote negative way. I want you to be praying for this individual. If you wake up in the middle of the night and God's giving you the burden to, burden to pray for someone, you're driving down the road and God says, turn off the radio. Let's do some prayer time. Or you're driving and the Holy Spirit brings a name to you. Don't ignore that. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, relationship. So David says, order my steps in thy word and let not any sin have dominion over me. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Remember Singapore, Michigan? The town was inundated with sand in just four years. And nobody woke up the next morning and said, oh, I wonder how many grains of sand have blown into our town to last night. No. All of a sudden, the sand's at your back door. And then you try to open your door, and you can't because that sand has blown against your house overnight. In four years, that town was no longer able to operate as a town. It became uninhabitable. Last week we spoke of the baby food and the real food. And as we finish up verse 133 this morning, 
This is not milk that we're sharing this morning. This is meat. This is the serious walk of Jesus Christ that we're talking about. Satan likes to tickle our ears, doesn't he? We have churches today where the pastors are tickling the ears of the people. If I just told you what you wanted to hear this morning, you would not grow in Christ. You are just all such a wonderful group of Christian people and you go out in the workplace tomorrow and you are just a testimony for the Lord and I've seen some of you give and you know your children are awesome and just keep being good. And you're like, yeah, right. You know, I know I've got sin issues. I know that at home you don't see my temper or I know at work you don't see my words and I know that you don't see the inner workings of my heart. See, God's not done with me yet. He's got a long way to go. And I've got a mind that needs to be filled with spiritual things. I need teaching just as much as you need teaching. I think I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, we were pouring concrete. We had a man out there that's poured concrete for over 30 years. I am certainly not going to say, hey, I know it all. I got this covered. Let's go ahead and, and take this, the thing across the concrete and get it all smoothed out and then wonder why it blisters in four weeks. What's wrong? Well, if you would have asked, I could have told you you did it too early. Um, great illustration for me as a believer that I don't know it all and I need more and more and more instruction in Jesus Christ. Let's be encouraged. Let's be challenged more than yesterday, to live our lives as a glory to our Savior. You know, let's be a wonderful edifier. You know, when, before the service starts this morning, it would be good for all of us to go and chat with someone and encourage, hey, how are things going? Um, I was talking with somebody the other day, and uh, you know, he said, hey, how's your finger coming along? Well, I injured it four weeks ago. You know, when he says to me, How's the finger coming along? Didn't you drop a refrigerator on it? You know, he was a guy, you know, and that's what guys do. But he showed an interest in me. He wanted to know, how's the finger coming along? Let's get to know. See, how did he know that? Well, he was interested in me. He got to know me a little bit. And that's so important for all of us to get to know more that's why I just love these work nights, uh, working with guys and gals and getting to know people in a deeper way. And uh, the one night we, we started with prayer and uh, Eric said to me, well, would you pray for my wife? She burned her hand. And so we prayed. Well, the next time I see his wife, what's my question going to be? Hey, how's your hand? Well, how did you know about it? Oh, we prayed for you last week. Wow, see how encouraging that is? That edifies, that builds up, that develops a closer relationship with a brother or sister in Christ. And then outside the church, we're not to live any differently than we are to live inside the church, are we? You know, whether it's home, work, you're out shopping, uh, whatever the case might be, be an edifier, be a testimony, be that Christian who expresses an interest in the other person. And by the way, and I heard this not too long ago, uh, this man made the accusation that sometimes Christians just want to get into somebody else's life just to share Jesus Christ with them. And I thought, hmm, that's my end goal, yes. But is it just a straight goal? No. I need to get to know that individual, show interest, get involved in a hobby, uh, in some other interest that that person has, express an interest in their children if, they're, if they have younger children. Um, let God open the door for that opportunity to share Jesus Christ with someone else. So we're going to finish this morning. That's the end of uh, verse 133. And uh, next week we're going to talk about 
being delivered from the oppression of man. We have enough of that, don't we? We do. But we have instruction from verse 133 on how to overcome sin. So when now we talk about the oppression of man in verse 134, ah, I've got some background, I've got some knowledge, I've got some preparation for verse 134. You know, when I go back to English class, you know, the subject and the verb, in case you didn't know this, are kind of important to a sentence. If you don't have a verb, you don't have a sentence. If you don't have a subject, you don't have a sentence. But that's the, for us, I hope that's a pretty simple concept. But I would never start teaching you diagramming without understanding that you have a solid grasp of the subject and the verb. I have to share this with you. I often play games with my kids, the mental games. So you're a senior, and we're diagramming sentences in class. So I'll take the whiteboard, and I'll put this huge, long sentence. Fills up the whiteboard. Now, this whiteboard's four by eight. So I've got this huge, long sentence, and you're supposed to pick out all the subjects and verbs and eventually diagram it. And I'm mean and cruel, so I'll often go to one of Paul's verses because Paul was the greatest grammarian, I think, that the world's ever known. And his verses are very difficult to diagram. But in that process, oh, wow, the spiritual truths that you glean in the, because you're talking about relationship of words. So we'll spend 15, 20 minutes in class, you know, and then I'll send them to the board and, you know, Diagram the sentence. And we'll get all done. And I'll say to the students, um, that's a fragment. By the way, a fragment is a part of a sentence. And they're like, oh, he got me again. You know, we have a great time with that. It's a great challenge to the kids because it makes them think. And you know what? You know what the fault is? They made some assumptions, as I wrote the sentence on the board, that Mr. L has created this long, long sentence, and now we have to diagram it. So they made the assumption, it's a sentence. And how many times do we as Christians make assumptions, and then God has to cause us to step back? So as we talk about the oppression of mankind next week, we can't take away how to get the victory during that oppression. We know for a fact as adults, the oppression's not going to go away. God's not going to flip a switch tomorrow and you wake up and the world's at peace and there's no money struggles and there's no relationship struggles and D.C. is going to get all of its ducks in a, in a row and the wars are going to stop. No. We understand that. But instead of grumbling and complaining, God gives us some real clear directions on how we are to walk. So look forward to that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the instruction. Uh, this is the meat of the word of God where this is how I'm supposed to walk. And not a, because I have to, but oh, to walk with God in a deeper way is so meaningful. It brings so much joy. It brings a greater purpose. Uh, I am edified, I am strengthened, I am growing in Christ, and that's what we want for our little children. We want them to mature physically, to get beyond the baby talk and be able to make words that we understand, and eventually we can carry on conversations with these little people. Lord, we would be very concerned if our children did not begin talking and begin walking. But Father, for us, help us to have a deeper conversation with you in prayer. Help us to have a deeper study of the Word of God. And then may that just overflow into our lives that we might experience that abundant walk with Christ. We give you the praise for these things this morning, Lord, in Christ.